hello, those of you who are just joining us. We are going to get started in a couple minutes, right at seven o'clock. I am just launching a poll, so it's going to pop up on the screen and ask you how many people are watching the program with you tonight. So as soon as you um, choose an answer, it will disappear off of your screen. Welcome in, everybody. We are going to get started right at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie Driscoll. I am from the Schomburg Library. We are very excited to have you joining us tonight. Um, a couple of things. If you just came on, um, you will see a poll on your screen. It's asking how many people you're watching the program with tonight. Just um, click that button and it'll disappear away from your screen. Um, during tonight's presentation, we do have the chat open. Please feel free to ask all of your questions in the chat. And then when the presentation is over, we will try and go through all of those and get answers um, to all of those questions for you guys. I am excited that we have Kate Carney here with us tonight. And let me just, oh, you know what? Everyone give me one second. Really quick. Okay, I just uh, lost her wonderful introduction, but then I just found it. So we are ready to go. Excellent. So Kate Carney is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Cook County Department of Environment and Sustainability. Her passion for sustainability and environmental topics started when she started to realize how much paper was going into the trash where she worked. This led to creating a paper recycling program for that company, followed by years of volunteer work with an environmental nonprofit in Milwaukee. She then made the decision to make a major career change and returned to college and earned a degree in conservation and environmental sciences from UW Milwaukee. Kate now has more than 10 years of professional experience in experience engaging residents and students on environmental topics, including composting, energy and water conservation, waste reduction, electric vehicles, and more. So we are so excited to have Kate here tonight to talk to us all about Electric Vehicles 101. And now I will turn it over to Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to give a lot of information about electric vehicles. This is a transition that's coming. We all hear about it all the time. And I really would like to be one resource that's providing some information so that when it comes time for each of you to make the decision for yourselves, whether or not you're going to go electric, you're at least armed with some of the basics and, and some, some reasons and some, some uh, benefits that, that come along with going electric in our vehicles. 
So to start off with, many people don't even know we have an a Department of Environment and Sustainability at Cook County's government. So this is going to um, possibly be the first introduction for many of you. We have in our department uh, a mission to foster healthy, resilient, thriving communities. We want to help improve quality of life, protect our natural environment, and promote sus both sustainability and environmental justice for all of us. Whether we're a resident or another stakeholder or both, we, we all deserve to have a, a healthy environment in which to work and um, recreate in. So we talk about, um, I do this through talking about a variety of topics and providing information about many, many different things, but today we will focus in on electric vehicles. So we'll talk about which types of electric vehicles specifically, all of the information I'm sharing with, uh, with you will um, work for, why electric vehicles are a good option, give you some examples. We'll do a little myth busting. We'll talk some charging information, and then I will do some highlights of some of the incentives and programs that are available to us now. So first and foremost, the specific type of electric vehicles we are talking about is a vehicle that drives on electricity from a battery that is charged from a plug. So any uh, all electric vehicle that uses energy stored in that battery that, that was charged just from plugging it in, or even a plug-in hybrid that um, only works, the battery only charges with plugging it in as opposed to some of the other um, types of hybrid vehicles we have like a Prius. That one is uh, kind of a self-charging situation. So the, um, the major things that we're talking about have to do with being able to plug your uh, electric vehicle into an outlet to charge that battery to make it go. So some key features about these electric vehicles are that Often the electric motors are smaller, so they can help to provide a roomier interior and they almost always provide a, a much quieter drive. Some uh, traditional gas vehicles are fairly quiet, but uh, pretty much every single electric vehicle is gonna be a very quiet drive. Many EVs also have regenerative braking and that can take a little bit of the wasted energy uh, from the process of slowing the vehicle and can redirect it back into the battery. It's a trickle, it's a tiny amount, but uh, sometimes every bit helps. And then there's also instant torque on your on electric vehicles and no gears to grind. So there's no transmissions in EVs. So uh, a primary benefit is reduced air pollution. Obviously, if there's no tailpipe, there's not gonna be any tailpipe emissions. This can really help to lower smog and greenhouse gas issues. We can also um, increase the, uh, well, we can further reduce air pollution by charging with electricity from renewable energy sources. Also, electric motors are far more efficient. They tend to um, lose only about 15 to 20% of the energy um, translating from the battery to turning those wheels versus a gasoline engine um, loses between 64 and 75% of its energy. And that's in, uh, in large part because we're actually combusting it right there in the engine. And we're taking um, the, the liquid, fuel and turning that into energy as opposed to the stored energy being redirected. Uh, additionally, better air health quality can lead to better health, reduced asthma, heart and lung diseases, and can even have a positive outcome or a positive influence on di diabetes, which is really important for many uh, folks in our, in our um, population. Additionally, uh, traditional internal combustion or gas powered vehicles have um, emissions. We know this. And a lot of that is greenhouse gases, particulate matters, and include things like carbon monoxide, the nitrogen oxides, uh, carbon that contributes to ozone and smog issues, formaldehydes also coming out of our tailpipes in addition to particulate matter. Particulate matter we're all a lot more familiar with now having gone through an intense summer with all of the smoke from the Canadian wildfires 
coming and affecting us so predominantly, but those tiny particles, just like with that, that smoke from those fires, the stuff coming out of our tailpipes can also get into our lungs. They can, they can build up in there and they can cause other damage. So reducing that benefits all of us. Uh, another benefit is that the total cost of ownership for the entire life of the vehicle is actually a lot less than a traditional internal combustion vehicle. So there's 90% fewer moving parts compared to an internal combustion vehicle. That leads us to far fewer maintenance needs. Um, even our brakes can last longer with that regenerative braking. You can see this chart here. I just pulled this from the, the Chevrolet website and um, it should be for the, the Chevy Bolt. There's three primary things that you need to do to maintain an electric vehicle. Obviously, we still need to make sure that our tires and our brakes are in good, uh, good repair. We want to take care of those, and that's a, a regular thing to be to you know to maintain. Uh, additionally, air filters are, are important to continue to maintain. And it's really only about every 150,000 miles where we have to do major, major things for the vehicle, and that includes draining and filling uh, the vehicle coolant circuits. So as you can see, there aren't those like every 3,000 or three month, um, 3,000 mile or three month oil changes. There's so many fewer moving parts that there's a less liquids that are in there that have to be cleaned out or, or changed out. So it's dramatically less. There's also um, tax incentives and Illinois has a rebate. Uh, additionally, the equivalent cost per mile is less for an, uh, for an electric vehicle versus a gasoline vehicle and electricity is still substantially less expensive than gasoline is. And I do have a chart that I'll show you just in, in a few slides. So just for reference, this is from the um, uh, Federal Department of Transportation. This is just kind of an, a high level. This is some of the primary differences between an electric vehicle versus a gasoline vehicle. As you can see, there is that big battery pack underneath the seats and the, the center and the bottom of the vehicle in an electric vehicle versus the gas tank and the all the, the, the pipes and tubes and wires that need to go from that storage tank up to the engine where it's going to combust. There's uh, different types of controllers. So there's like a, an electronics controller versus having to have a transmission and, and all the other um, moving parts that will help make um, that gasoline turn into an energy that can make the car go. So this is just a high level, um, just so you can see some of the primary differences. The vehicle, the price of vehicles is also reducing. So that's getting more affordable in general right now. The thing that is helping to or, or causing electric vehicles to be um, harder to access for many people is that upfront cost. So once you can get past that hurdle and can find a vehicle that's available, that long-term cost is going to be substantially lower. But in the beginning, electric vehicles in general are, are a bit more expensive to a lot more expensive than an internal combustion vehicle. But Tesla, who has the majority of vehicles on the road in the U.S. currently, they have reduced their Model 3, which is one of their most popular because it's one of the more affordable versions, by about $5,000 this year, and their Model X by about $10,000. So those are substan substantial price decreases. Overall, between June of 2022 and June of 2023, the average new EV price fell by about 20%. So that's across all brands. Um, some of them dropped more than others, but the average across the board is 20% lower. And so that's great news for making that more accessible to, to more of us. Additionally, used EV prices have dropped during that same time period by um, nearly 30% on average. So substantial prices, uh, price decreases are, are coming into effect as we get more models and, and more manufactured, there's more chance that this will continue to become more and more affordable. 
Additionally, there's some safety benefits. So having all those batteries in the bottom of the car helps to lower the center of gravity. Those batteries are not lightweight. So that can help offer us better handling with safe driving practices, especially in wet or icy conditions. And additionally, that instant torque can help to reduce some of those tire spinning uh, situations we find ourselves in in icy conditions. And that regenerative braking helps to ease our, our, the, the car's speed slowly and in a controlled manner that helps to assist you as the driver. So with safe driving practices, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, we all need to drive safely, but these things can help to increase that safety even more. So those are great benefits. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a variety of charging options. So that can definitely be counted as a benefit. In some parts of the county, we have more charging options than others. This is a map that as of December 2022, this is all of the charging stations in Cook County. As you can tell, there are some places that have more, especially clustered in downtown Chicago. But up here in the northern suburbs, we have quite a few options. And these options have continued to grow through time. Um, additionally, there's uh, other programs that are increasing that right now. So uh, you can charge your at, at home, at work, or public charging stations. Some of our workplaces have that option for us. Public charging um, in certain scenarios is often free. So if you are just running to the grocery store, grocery stores like Whole Foods in particular, often will have charging stations that you can use for free while you're in the store. That is a store by store situation, but there's many that have that. Um, additionally, uh, at, at certain county courthouses, if you uh, happen to be there, there are some free and very low cost charging options at some of those. So there's some good options there. There's also a variety of websites and apps that can help you to find public charging stations. This is just a few of the examples. PlugShare and ChargePoint are both um, companies that have charging networks. So much like you would go to a mobile or a BP, you could potentially go to a PlugShare or ChargePoint. And those are just the tip of the iceberg. There's many, many others. Uh, they happen to have pretty decent and usable maps, interactive maps on their website. ComEd actually has a really great um, public charger um, mapping tool and for ComEd territory, so around here. And then the Department of Energy, the Federal Department of Energy, has an amazing mapping tool for the entire U.S. So if you have decided to go electric and you need to map out a trip, that's going to be a great way that you can find charging stations all over the country. So let's talk about some of the options that are out there. This is some of the mo most affordable. These two are some of the more affordable electric vehicle models. But I do want to note that manufacturers are anticipating that over the next two years, uh, amongst all of the different manufacturers, there's going to be close to 80 new models coming. So um, or over the years, in the next two years, there's going to be multiple dozens. So that's a lot of really great new options that will be out there to help to um, meet all of our needs. But these are some of the more affordable ones. So the Nissan Leaf, they've been on the road here in the U.S. for a very long time. We've probably all seen quite a few different um, versions of the Leaf. They start around 28,000 with a range of 150 miles per charge. They do have a, a plus series, which is uh, a slightly over 200 mile range, starting more expensive at 36,000. However, there's a lot of used leafs out there and you can find some of the older leafs for like under 10 to $15,000, which makes it super accessible. It does have a shorter range in those older ones because technology has gotten better. And obviously with any kind of the, the chart, the, the battery component, those do um, lose some of their efficiency over time, but um, believe me, it's not like our cell phones though. So uh, they will lose some of their ability to charge, but we're not gonna see massive drops after just a short time the way we see on some of our other rechargeable battery electronics. The Chevy Bolt is another great option. It's been around for quite a while. 
This one has a higher range of around 259 miles and starts less expensive than the Leaf at 26,500. This has a variety of options to it. So that range, that, that's just a starting price that can go more expensive. There's also a version called the Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid. You can find both of these used now and um, the volts you can find for even under 20,000. So you get good gas mileage, plus you have that, that 50 plus mile range on the battery when charged. Uh, next would be our heavy duty vehicles because some people need these. Maybe you have a camper you need to tow or maybe you work in a field that you have to have a large vehicle to be able to get your work done effectively. So Rivian, those are now being manufactured here in Illinois, among a few other places in the U.S. I have been seeing these everywhere. They also have an SUV model, um, but specifically the R1T, which is their pickup truck, has a range starting at 260 miles per charge and can go over 400 miles depending on the model you choose. They start with that, that smaller range at around 73,000 and you can get these pretty quickly. Uh, like I said, these some of these are being manufactured here in Illinois, so there is a lot of access. Then uh, Ford recently, just last year, announced that they were making their F-150 Lightning into an all-electric version. They have a range of around 320,000 or 320 miles, and they're a lot more affordable in that right around $50,000 range, which isn't completely out of um, uh, expectations for a heavy-duty vehicle. This one's taking a little bit longer to get but we've dropped down from about a year to only about three months for delivery. So this one's one, if you want it, you're interested in it, you're gonna have to end up getting on a wait list, unfortunately. Also for those like midsize SUVs or crossovers, both Kia and Hyundai have great options. Uh, the Kia Nero is an all electric vehicle, has a range of a little over 250 miles, starts around $40,000. Uh, the Honda Ionic 5, I've been seeing these all over the place. They've just like, feels like they've just had a sudden burst of, of popularity. They have several different models with ranges of 220 to 303 miles per charge. And they start just a little bit higher at around 41, 42,000. Both of these models have equivalents that come in a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid and um, can be found used and new. So there's some, some good options there for both Kia and Hyundai. Now, Tesla, that's the most popular one. Most of us, when we think EV, we think Tesla first because they just have a tremendous market share. So as you can see, the Tesla Model 3 has a range of around 267 miles per charge. It's now starting at just over 40,000. It was uh, at about 45,000 uh, last year. So you can see that's where that price came down. Model X has a range that's higher. It's a, it's a slightly larger vehicle. It's a lot more expensive. This one has come down substantially um, to 89,880 starting for a range with a range of 348 miles. So these are not necessarily in everybody's price range, but really great examples to see how uh, the popularity of electric vehicles in this transition is helping to bring that price down. All right, so let's talk about some myths. Some of our major concerns that, that we all think of with the idea of transitioning from our gas powered vehicles to an electric vehicle. So one of them is that many people are, have a lot of range and anxiety. So being concerned that your EV isn't gonna have enough range per charge to accomplish the things you want to accomplish in your, um, your expectations for a vehicle. So um, for most of us on most days, it's not going to be a problem. The average U.S. car driver or owner only drives an average of 39 miles a day. So obviously that's different for every single one of us. Some of us drive more, some of us drive less, but an average of 39 miles per day is no problem for even a used leaf. So knowing that for our normal everyday stuff, 
most of us would not have a, a, any difficulty with the range available to us. Uh, the battery range continues to increase with newer models. So, uh, I mean, even just the LEAF, it's gone from having a, you know, 90 to 100 mile range to starting at 150 mile range for the more affordable version of it. So as you can see over time, this, the, um, the, the battery range is just getting better. There's lots of companies that are doing research to find even better ways to make batteries and um, more sustainable ways. So that's gonna continue to get even better over time. Charging networks and charging stations are getting they're, they're just getting um, more, uh, they're, the, the, they're expanding. So there's just more charging options for us. Additionally, the state of Illinois is receiving federal funds that's going to help to expand the interstate charging network. So the federal government wants to make sure that people can go from state to state and can have access to fast chargers along the highway. This is the only way we can make that transition from gas, right? Is if we need to go distances to be able to find really good charging options along the way. And then we also have a um, an initiative that we will be installing uh, around 75 charging stations all over suburban Cook next year. So we're currently working on figuring out those best locations and finding contractors to help us get those installed. Another myth is that EVs aren't good in cold weather. So they do have a reduction in battery range, but we also get a reduction in fuel efficiency from our gas cars when we're using our heaters and our seat warmers and, and all those really important peripherals that keep us comfortable in our vehicles and keep us safe. So the, 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 the reduction is similar to what we would see in a gas vehicle. And but translates to the reduced range. So um, for most models, it is it's happening, but it's not super significant. But um, but but it is it is um, it, it is something to know. Uh, additionally, like I said before, that instant torque and regenerative braking can help us with um, reducing slipping and also not getting stuck as often. Um, some of us live on side streets or on rural roads that don't necessarily get. Uh, plowed very quickly. So having these um, additional tools can help with some of, um, alleviate some of the issues that we have there. Uh, we also have a lot of concerns about safety and reliable, reliability issues with batteries. And those are definitely concerns that we need to address. But uh, we are having a lot of companies that are looking for ways to give batteries a second life as electricity storage but they are designed for a long lifespan. It's not like our, our cell phones. Our cell phones are designed to have a rapid loss of, of, of chargeability and like that battery maintaining its charge on purpose. It's planned obsolescence and that happens so that we buy a new one. That is not happening with electric vehicles because we can't just plop a new battery into a, 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 an electric vehicle or just buy a new electric vehicle as easily. It's, a, it's about the scale. So um, when we're thinking about our rechargeable battery in an electric vehicle, it's not the same as other types of rechargeable batteries from electronics that we have experience with. So it's they're meant to last a long time. Uh, additionally, gas powered cars are 60 times more prone to fires than electric vehicles are. So um, this company, Auto Insurance Easy, took information and data from the National Transportation Safety Board the Bureau of Transportation Statistics and government recall information. And they found that hybrids have actually, unfortunately, the most fires per 100,000 100, vehicles. Um, that's most likely because they utilize two different powertrains. So there's, there's two different opportunities for that to happen. Um, ICE or internal combustion engine vehicles or traditional gas powered vehicle caught uh, fire substantially less, which is great at 1,530 per 100,000 vehicles. And EVs were only um, experiencing 25 fires per 100,000 vehicles. So that's really, really good news, right? So the, the safety is there. Obviously, when uh, an electric vehicle does catch fire, it is a much harder fire for firefighters to fight. So with continued um, 
safe driving practices, we can make sure that we're staying safe there. But there's very few incidences of just a, um, a fire starting in an electric vehicle. All right, so more about charging. So there are three typical ways to charge. So we have our level AC level one charger, which is essentially just plugging into a regular outlet with your vehicle. This is the kind of thing that you would want to do in your garage or in your driveway overnight. It's a slow charge. You get about three to five miles per hour of charging. Uh, typically, that's not an issue if you're plugging in when you get home for the day and you should be fully charged by the next day. You don't even have to charge every single day for most electric vehicles, especially when we're only driving around that average of, of 39 or 40 miles per day. But um, so you should be able to get the majority of your charge back just with an overnight charge. Uh, many households choose to upgrade to a level two charger, and that would require, uh, I do recommend having an electrician come and check, make sure you have capacity in your electrical box, and then it's got a special plug. And it's uh, akin to, if you have an electric dryer, you know, has that bigger plug, that's pretty much what would be um, used for a level two charger. You can also actually install a charging station at your home. It's not like what we see out in public there, but there is a special like um, thing that you can install in your garage for charging. And that would get you the, ever, the AC level two charger. That's significantly faster at 20 to 10 to 20 miles per hour of charging. Uh, this is something you would find in residential, like, we could do that in our homes. A lot of like fleet charging and public charging is this. So if you take advantage of the free charging at like Whole Foods, for example, it would be the level two charging. So you'd be in there for half an hour, so you could get five, 10, 15 miles of charge to your battery during that time you're in there. And then there's the fast charger. And this isn't something you're typically gonna have at your house. Uh, if you're in a single family house, some, condos or apartments, multi-unit residential buildings would potentially install one of these. This could also be a fleet situation. And then this is also what the federal government is trying to get installed along our highways to make sure that we can get where we need to go. So um, that's 80% of the charge typically and only 20 to 30 minutes of charging. So thinking about it in terms of every time I've driven a long distance when I need to stop for gas, I'm also you know using the restroom, maybe getting a snack, Depends on how long you've been driving, maybe you need to move around a little bit. And so 20 to 30 minutes of charging is going to be pretty close to if you stopped and filled up and then did all the other things too. So um, typically this is, you know, potentially going to be a bit longer than a quick stop at the gas station. But um, when you're utilizing that, you do actually have the benefit of pretty fast charge. So Early on in the presentation, I said that the equivalent cost per mile for an electric vehicle is less expensive than for a gas vehicle. And this is where I'm getting that information or one of the places. So this is from a Consumer Reports um, report in October of 2020. So these dollar amounts aren't the most accurate, but the discrepancy between the two types of charging are. As you know, we all know gas is more expensive now than it was in October of 2020, and uh, electricity is a little bit more expensive as well. But the difference is still striking. So for driving 15,000 miles in a sedan in our, our normal car is going to cost us around $1,400, according to Consumer Reports in 2020. But charging those same 15,000 miles in an EV is about $800 less at around 620. So that's a significant savings. Same thing goes with those SUVs like the, the Kia Niro's. It's going to be a significant difference, um, also less than half, you know, a, a difference of $1,000 in savings for the electricity. And even for those pickup trucks, those heavy duty vehicles, you can see significant savings in uh, charging your car, your pickup truck versus putting gas into it. So a savings of $1,300 over those 15,000 miles. So this is one of those ways that besides the low maintenance costs, having much lower costs per mile can really help to save a lot of money over the, the, the life of that vehicle.
A lot of people ask me if I'm charging my my electric vehicle at home, what is that going to cost me? So please bear with me. This is a bit of a rambling um, example. I'm still trying to figure out a way to make it a little bit clearer, but I used that average of 39 miles per day for this example, just to have something kind of like universal to, to use to explain it. So if we're driving 39 miles a day, in a month, we're driving, you know, 1,186 miles. Uh, Kelly Blue Book estimates that it takes about 0.34 kilowatt hours per mile to charge your vehicle. ComEd electricity price for my April bill was just over nine and a half cents. So these are the, the parameters that I'm using. Um, right now, electricity is slightly less expensive than this, um, but... This is just kind of an average to give you an idea. So 1,186 miles times that 0.34 kilowatt hours is gonna says that we're gonna need 397 kilowatt hours of charging per month. Now, if we multiply that by the cost per kilowatt hour from ComEd's April number, that's going to cost us just under $40 for a month. So uh, you could expect that you're going to if you're driving 40 miles a day, it's going to cost you $4 to $500 per year of, for charging at home if you're only charging at home. So this is going to be the most affordable way. There's some other tools that you can use to actually reduce that cost even more, like hourly pricing from ComEd. But um, just on average, this is what you can expect. However, if you are using public charging stations, it's generally going to, to cost more because it is a market, right? So we're paying what the providers choose to charge us. So there's lots of different brands. I've mentioned two already. I've got examples from three here. So um, there is a lot of different options. Uh, right now, when I when I looked it up, these are the ones that I could find information easily on their websites without having to like sign up for an account. So one company is Electrify America. They charge you 48 cents per kilowatt hour versus that 9.7 cents per kilowatt hour from ComEd as a guest um, or 36 cents with a $4 monthly fee. Uh, EVgo is another. They charge you a reservation fee plus 30 cents per minute. Um, but they do have um, several different subscriptions, so you can pay a monthly fee and then you can forego that reservation fee and get a lower per minute charging rate. And then there's ChargePoint, which has tons of chargers in our area. They have a, a subscription where you pay $7.99 a month and then you pay $0.26 cents per kilowatt hour. So there's a wide range. I mean, just looking at this is a big range, um, but many other different um, companies that are providing charging services. So you would want to find out what's nearest to you that you would be utilizing and then figuring out if there was uh, one of these companies that you would maybe want to do a subscription with. But it's a, a different for everybody kind of a situation. Um, so now let's talk incentives. Other ways that we can help to bring down that initial cost of going electric, because that's a really important thing to consider. So Illinois uh, last year, two years ago, two years ago, passed the uh, Climate Equitable Jobs Act or CJA, and they have rebates that have go on a cycle. We're about to start the next cycle on November 1st. This will be open for 90 days. You can get a $4,000 per um, rebate after the purchase of an EV that works for new or used vehicles has to be within 60 days. Um, your purchase has to be 60 within 60 days from the date of your application. So if you bought one today, you would have 60 days to submit your application, but you wouldn't be able to do that until after November 1st. So that's going to cut into that time a little bit. Um, there is a, an application you have to fill out. You wanna fill it out very carefully because if you miss one thing, it will disqualify you from getting this. Uh, one of the really cool benefits of this is that if they, um, if you've done everything right, it's they're gonna send you a check for $4,000. So it's um, it's just a, a straight rebate, which is, is really beneficial. There are some um, income qualified like priorities given, but any one of us, if we bought the vehicle for our own personal use, 
we can submit this application within the cycle window uh, as long as we we meet all the criteria like purchase within 60 days from the date of our application and in an open cycle, those types of things. There's more information if you go to the Illinois webpage, it's done through the Illinois uh, EPA. Additionally, I mentioned ComEd hourly pricing. That's another great way that might help you to lower cost of your electricity in charging. Um, that is uh, kind of a a variety of prices throughout the day based on demand on the overall grid. So when a lot of people are using electricity, the prices will go higher. And when not many people are using electricity, like overnight, the prices go down. So you could potentially get a much lower cost. Um, I have enjoyed hearing from a couple of people. This is not a guarantee it's going to happen, but a couple of people have said that um, that has happened to them, that that the comment has actually like had to pay them for charging their vehicle because the the cost of electricity went negative. So they were using that electricity at a time with like very little demand. And so they got such a great deal that it reduced their electric bill. And that's a, a rare thing, but kind of cool to think that that could maybe happen because we don't get a whole lot of benefits from, from electricity providers. Um, additionally, there's some federal incentives. So there is currently a tax credit for the purchase of select new plug-in electric vehicles. So those are going to be 2023, 2022 and 23 and newer. There is a website that you should check out if you're thinking about going with an electric vehicle. You know what you have in mind. I would go to this website and make sure that the one you're interested in qualifies. There are some requirements. So it has to um, be within a certain MSRP. It has to have final assembly in the United States. You have to... Um, fall within a certain adjusted gross income. All of that information is on their website and it is all very personal to each one of us. So um, I do recommend going there and seeing your seeing which specific criteria you um, what you can qualify for. So that is with um, a tax return when you do your file your taxes, you file a special form to get that. So you really only benefit from it if you have a tax liability that you can claim that against. However, the Department of Treasury has just laid out rules for uh, car dealerships to be able to offer starting in January, a price reduction up to that $7,500 um, if you meet the criteria at the point, the time of purchase, as opposed to having to wait for that tax credit. So more people will be able to benefit from that. And that's going to help significantly bring down the cost initially for that purchase of us. So that's great news. As you can see here, there's a couple of different vehicles that are listed here. This is not a full or comprehensive list by any means. I just wanted you to see. So for example, a Tesla Model 3 2022 or 2023, if it excuse me, has an MSRP of 55,000 or less, you would qualify for that $7,500 tax credit amount. So um, go, I would recommend going to this website fueleconomy.gov slash FEG slash slash tax 2023 to see the requirements, to see this full list and check out which vehicles are eligible right now. Additionally, there is a smaller credit available for used plug-in um, EVs and plug-in hybrid EVs. So uh, that's 30% of the sale price up to 400 or up to 4,000. You have to have purchased the vehicles on or after January 3rd of, 1st of this year. There's more details. There's also an AGI requirement, um, but you can see there's also not all vehicles qualify, so you would want to go to the list. But hey, if you're looking for a hybrid SUV Bentley, the 2020 and 2021 plug-in hybrid qualifies for that. So um, I just thought it was kind of funny that that was on this list. So Make sure you're going to the websites to find out if the specific vehicles you're interested in qualify. This is also a helpful tool for figuring out if you qualify. 
This is a decision tree that was created by Energy Innovation. You can get to it on their website. Um, you can see it here. Um, but it's just an, a really nice decision tree to help you figure out that you qualify for all those different pieces of court that are that are part of the tax incentives. Uh, additionally, there's some other incentives that are outside of the actual purchase of the vehicle. Uh, I do recommend going to rewiringamerica.org. They have a lot of really great information about electrifying uh, our homes, businesses, and, and even tools for governments. They are a nonprofit, so they have really great information. Um, it's reliable. And they also have the IRA or Inflation Reduction Act calculator. And if you go to that calculator, you put in the information about your specific situation. So whether you're a renter or a homeowner, how you file your taxes, the number of people in your household, approximate household income, your zip code, and then they'll show you all the things you qualify for. And then you can also just go through what all the tax credits are, which is the, the, the picture along the side there. And you can get information about what's available, what the, what the qualifications are, those types of things. So for example, right now, there is a $600 tax credit available for upgrading your electrical panel. That's going up to up to $4,000 next year. And then um, there's also like some rules that if you do that, you also have to do something else from the list. So like you could up oh, new electric vehicles on there or um, switching over, adding solar. There's lots of different things. So they work in conjunction with each other in some cases. All the details are laid out really nicely at rewiringamerica.org. Additionally, uh, I did mention it briefly, but Cook County launched our charging initiative. And so we are trying to very um, intentionally fill in some of the gaps that you can see around suburban Cook County, where we need to have more charging stations. These are being done with a lot of community input. We had a survey that was out and um, people were suggesting locations across suburban Cook County where they would want to see a charger. And then we're working with other, um, other entities like could be churches, it could be a village hall, it could be a library, could be some other like store and trying to find great places to fill these gaps by installing those chargers. And then the partner will be taking over its maintenance and, and deciding how things are charged from there. So um, just increasing access was really important to us. And in a way that was not going to put more in downtown Chicago, where there's already infinite um, options for charging. So that's something that we were working on. Additionally, I do like to point out that um, the state of Illinois does have a higher first time issuance of a electric vehicle license plate. So when you register your new electric vehicle for the first time, you are going to pay a higher registration fee. That is because they are trying to make up for the losses of those gas taxes that they will not be re re uh, receiving from you going to the gas pump. So as you can see here, your first time issuance would be $406. There are more details about that on the um, electric vehicle license plate page. Here's some helpful links. Uh, I have also provided to the library a, um, a list of all of my resources. And so it has either gone out in an email already or you will receive this in, that in an email. So we can do questions. Okay, thank you so much for all that information. That was awesome. Okay, so um, first Bob asked, are these slides available? And you just touched on that. Um, if they haven't already, oh, sorry, you can I, talk. I have the, the resource list that I've already sent, but I can put it into a PDF and send it to Chris to share. Okay, perfect. Okay, we, can make it, we can make them available. I'll send those to you. Right. Awesome. Okay, and the next thing, um, Bob K says, if you switch to ComEd, hourly rates charging at night is typically one to two cents per kilowatts. A full charge costs less than a dollar. 
That's true. That can happen. Sometimes it is still higher, you know, if we've got a lot of air conditioners running and when we have right. particularly hot nights, but you're absolutely right. It can, it can work out to be very inexpensive to charge overnight. Um, the, the hourly pricing doesn't fit everybody. Even if you have an EV, it doesn't fit for everybody. Um, I have heard from, from some people that their, their bill actually went up because they were really meticulous about energy efficiency and saving energy in the first place. Um, so I definitely would have a conversation with the, the comed at the comed phone number, but um, yeah, you're right, Bob. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Um, all right, Cindy wants to know how long do these batteries last and what does it cost to replace them? So most of the batteries are expected to last at least that 150,000 miles, but most of them are going far longer than that. And um, it depends on the, the vehicle, of course, but um, to replace the batteries, you would expect it to be somewhere in like eight to $11,000 range. So not inexpensive, but um, also you don't in expect to have to do that like right away. Okay, Peggy wants to know how much environmental difference is there between a hybrid vehicle and an EV? Well, the major difference is that there's no tailpipe on the EV. There's still a tailpipe on the, the, the hybrid uh, because you're using that, that battery to the extent that you have the range and, and for the type of driving. Like in a, in a hybrid, you're pretty much never going to be using the battery on the highway. It's, it's almost always going to switch over to the gasoline. So uh, from that perspective, you're, we're kind of dealing with the um, environmental impact of the battery situation because we know that there's um, environmental consequences of creating these batteries right now. That's why a lot of a lot of researchers are trying to come up with better ways to do it because most of these are lithium. So um, so you have that plus then you have the tailpipe emissions and you know getting the gasoline refined. So um, Nothing is perfect, but uh, to go full EV, if that's something that is accessible to you and will work within what you need, um, it's going to be much, much more environmentally uh, positive than a hybrid. But a hybrid is a really great like interim, right, to get away from the full gas vehicle and to be able to do your around town driving and, and use those for those needs without having the emissions is really great and really important. So um, yeah, so definitely much bigger positive impacts with full EV um, as far as those things are concerned, but a, a hybrid is still a great option. Um, do all public char chargers require some sort of pre-registration or a subscription or monthly fee? Do you know of any public chargers that you can just drive up to and plug in and get and use a credit card right there to charge your car? I think that there are some. I can't tell you a specific company off the top of my head. Um, I think that for many, you can just register with a um, an account and then you can do kind of that like you go there and you plug in and it just charges your credit card. Uh, I don't think that there's really any that are like gas pump like where you can go right. and just like swipe your card. Um, I don't think that there's really any um, chargers that are that way. But um, but every like I said, there's so many different companies and they're all right. Um, and then do you recycle the batteries? So yeah, so there is a, a new company in, well, they're not like super new, but in Arizona that's taking these batteries and is like shredding them to get the stuff that can be reused out of it, the materials that can be um, repurposed into new batteries or into other, other needs, and then they're recycling the other, the leftover components. Um, but then there's also a lot of companies that are, um, figuring out ways to kind of connect multiple car like the batteries and in, in, in big multiples to store uh, wind and solar energy so that it can be used when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't out so um yeah so there are some like more traditional recycling options and then there's more options that are um, just really extending the life of that battery because just because it's not the most efficient in a vehicle anymore doesn't mean it's not still a great option for for holding electricity mm -hmm. um 
Bob also said that he was talking to someone a month ago with an original 2008 Tesla Roadster, and wow. the battery is still at 85 to 90% of its original capacity. Oh, there you go. Yeah, they, right? they're, they're made to last a long time. That's a major difference from the things that we're kind of conditioned to now. You know, we buy a new cell phone and we know that in a couple of years, suddenly it's not going to hold its charge right? as well as it did when we bought it. And that's by design. And, and we don't have that design in, in electric vehicles, fortunately. Um, how do the heating and air conditioning systems work in an EV? They're just powered by electricity. So uh, the difference between, you know, like our traditional um, gas furnace versus like an air source heat pump, it's using electricity to move that heat around. So it's, just all, it's all done with electricity from our battery. And then what are the trade-in options on EVs? Um, meaning like I have an old Tesla Roadster from 2008 and still has an awesome battery and I want to get a newer model trade-in. Um, that depends on the dealer that you can find. So I know that, um, well, I'm in Northbrook and you guys are in Schaumburg and, and Hinsdale is far away from us, but, um, I specifically know there's an all electric car dealer there. Um, so like that kind of a situation is going to be far more beneficial to trading in an EV versus going to a more traditional car dealership. Mm -hmm. But, um, most of the major car manufacturers are already training their car dealerships to be able to be more knowledgeable to sell and to then, you know, resell these types of vehicles. So it's getting better every day. Um, and I think that it's truly a case by case. Um, there's a lot of companies like Carvana, they, they right. will buy and resell electric vehicles. So there's, there's a variety of options. Nice. Well, that is the end of our questions. Um, awesome. Also, Bob, Bob has another tidbit for us. Bob, you know a lot about electric <laughs> vehicles. He uh, was saying voltage chargers are free um, wherever they are. So many other places have free charging. So okay, I think perfect. it would just be doing a little bit of research on that. And you might be mm -hmm. able to, to figure out some spots. Yeah. Um, there's always a learning curve, right? So you're right, going to yes. get to know your vehicle just like I, I still drive a gas vehicle because I'm also the type of person that holds on to my car as long as I possibly can. Our next vehicle right. is most likely going to be an EV. And, you know, hopefully that's still a little ways away, but I'm driving a 2010 Toyota with 150 some thousand miles on it. So, oh, okay. like, you know, I know if that, if I'm getting close to that E, I know exactly how far I can push it. And we yeah. learn those things about our EVs as well. Just like we know where the best gas stations are, we're going to know where the best charging options are for when we're out and about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kate, thank you so much. This yeah, was so you. informative. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, for everybody on here, this was um, recorded. And also, Kate is going to send her slides. And then so we will send them all to you. So thank you all so much um, for joining us this evening. And thank you again to Kate. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night.